So today's video is going to be about H.H. H. Holmes, otherwise known as the Devil of Chicago. He was born as Herman Webster Mudgett on May 16th of 1861 to his parents Levi and Theodate Price. So he did change his name very frequently, but just for the video I'm going to refer to him as Holmes, um, just because he had so many different aliases and things like that. Holmes was the middle child of five. He had an older brother and sister, as well as a younger brother and sister. His father, Levi, was a farmer, but he did pick up spare jobs just to make some extra money. They were a very wealthy family, but they didn't by any means need that extra money, and Holmes would sometimes accompany him to the job sites, which is actually where Holmes met his first wife. But before we get into that, I'm gonna jump back to his father Levi. It is said by some sources that Levi was abusive to all of his children, including Holmes, but back in the 1800s, child abuse was a very different thing. Um, punishments were a lot different then, so what he was doing to them may not have been considered child abuse then, but it is now, so I'm not going to credit that really. Um, it's just something that was said. Holmes' school life wasn't the best. He did have a group of friends, so he wasn't like a loner or anything. He actually knew how to make friends, but he was bullied frequently. He had a strabismic left eye. Strabismus is a medical condition, which is actually like a lazy eye in layman's terms. So he got made fun of for that quite frequently. But the bullies also did know that Holmes was terrified of the doctor, like absolutely horrified to go. It was said that at one point, his bullies actually took him to a local doctor's office and forced him to stare at and touch a human skeleton that was there. And they were expecting him to be really freaked out. And at first he was, but this fear quickly grew into a fascination. And this is where it started the human anatomy fascination that Holmes got into. Holmes was really, really intelligent and he obtained information so easily. Like, he was a lot smarter than most of the people that he was around. He was a very clever guy. Now, I do want to go on to say that this is an old case, so it has been told over and over again and there was very poor documentation back in the 1800s when it all happened. So a lot of myths and stories have been added into it that aren't exactly true, but I did the best research that I could to find facts and I fact checked myself over and over again on this case. I've been working on it for about a week and a half now, so it's taken me some time. There are some sources that say whenever he was a teenager that he began to kidnap and kill local animals like even people's pets. He was stealing their pets out of their yards and stuff like that. But his mother actually came forward and said that Holmes loved animals and he especially loved dogs and that he never killed any animals. So that wasn't a telltale sign of him being a serial killer like it is with most serial killers. I think that may have been just something that's been added in over the years just to make it more appealing to certain audiences that think that serial killers have to go through those certain steps to get there. But his mother did come forward and say that that was completely false. Now, there is no evidence behind this next thing that happened, but a lot of people believe that his first actual kill was his friend Tom. I'm not exactly sure on the age that Holmes was, Holmes was when this happened, but they went for a walk and they came across an abandoned building and when they went into this building, Tom fell from a ledge and he died. And this was also another time that his fascination with human anatomy really started growing. So some people have said that they think Holmes wanted to know what it was like to kill someone and to see that anatomy in person. But they were both kids and I think it was really probably just an accident and he didn't intentionally kill his friend or anything. I think his friend probably did just fall, but that probably did really help Holmes get into the whole anatomy of people and wanting to see what it looked like again. So again, like I said, Holmes was a very, very smart man. 
He graduated high school at the age of 16, and he began taking teaching jobs and odd farm jobs with his father. They were out on a farm job whenever he met a farmer's daughter. Her name was Clara Lovering, and Holmes fell for Clara immediately. Like, within a day of meeting her, he fell head over heels for this girl. But at the time, Clara was seeing another man who wasn't very nice to her. Um, I believe from some sources that I read, he was abusing her, but I'm not 100% positive on that. It may have just been, like, verbally he wasn't very kind to her at all. And one day, Holmes caught him being very, very mean to Clara and defended her, and Clara then fell madly in love with Holmes. They went on to get married, and then two years later, they had a son. His name was Robert Mudgett. And then two years after that, when Holmes was 22 years old, he enrolled into medical school at University of Michigan. He then graduated two years later from that point. He was an apprentice for the chief of anatomy, and that's when his fascination really started to get very, very out of hand. Holmes started stealing the cadavers from the medical school and taking them home, and he would mutilate their bodies. And this is where it starts to get into him being a con man and just a very bad man all the way around. He stole these bodies because they were free bodies and he would open insurance policies on them, like $1,000 insurance policies for life insurance. He would take them home, mutilate and dissect them and basically just make them unrecognizable. And then he would claim them from the life insurance and say that they had died in some sort of tragic accident he would collect the money and he would keep it for himself and then around that time is when he actually changed his name to hh holmes which stands for henry howard holmes or other variations of that it he actually had many many different aliases like that's not the only one he used but that's the most common and that's what he's known by before he graduated Clara took their son and actually moved back to New Hampshire and some sources say that he was abusive to Clara and that's why she left. It was like an escape that she did it when he didn't know and that's why the divorce was never officially finalized. Holmes married several different women. He was very charming. He won over tons and tons of women with his way with words and I wouldn't say good looks, but for that time period, I guess you could say he was good looking. After he graduated, Holmes began traveling states in the U.S., and he traveled for quite some time before he eventually settled down in 1886 in Chicago, but then it came up that in New York and Pennsylvania, there was strands of missing boys that they somehow believe were linked to Holmes, but has never actually been proven that it was him that did that. Once he settled in Chicago, he came across a young couple who owned a pharmacy. The girl's name was Elizabeth S. Holton, and he really, really liked this pharmacy, and he was intrigued by it. So he went inside, and he worked his charm, and he got a little job with them, and he worked his job every day, and he was good at it. He did what he was supposed to do there. He eventually made really good friends with Elizabeth and her husband, And then around this time is when he met his second wife, Murda. They went on to have a daughter named Lucy in 1889. Now, there is a myth that has actually been confirmed that it's not true, but some people believe that Elizabeth S. Holton and her husband were an elderly couple and that her husband passed away in some bizarre incident and it left this little old lady to take care of this pharmacy all by herself and she just couldn't handle it anymore. They weren't actually elderly and some people believe that they were actually younger than Holmes, if I remember correctly from my research, but she went on to actually sell her pharmacy to Holmes, but the story goes that she sold her pharmacy to Holmes Um, because she couldn't take care of it anymore. She was just too old and couldn't do it by herself. And then soon after the deed went into Holmes' name, she passed away in tragic circumstances as well. But that isn't true. Neither of the Holtons actually died. They actually went on to outlive Holmes. Holmes and the Holtons were very friendly. They were good friends, in fact. 
Holmes offered to buy the pharmacy from them to just take it off their hands and give them a little less to worry about. And the couple agreed and they sold it to him and they went on to live happy lives. When he purchased his pharmacy, he also purchased the plot of land next door or across the street from the pharmacy. The plot of land was about a block long. He made blueprints for his murder house, which is where he ultimately ended up building it, was across the street from the pharmacy he owned. The blueprints were for a two-story building that was a block long. He planned on the first floor being a jeweler, a few shops, a barber shop, and another pharmacy just to get the business coming in so that where people were coming around and coming into this murder house that he had built. It was all a ploy to get people there so he could kill them, which is really crazy to think about now, but then I guess it wasn't so crazy. At some point during the construction, Holmes decided that he wanted a third floor, which is where he wanted to make his hotel rooms. And this was so he could make more money, but ultimately it was rooms that he was using to kill people. Although the third floor was never actually a functioning hotel, he would charge people to come stay there, um, but wouldn't actually advertise it as a hotel. The construction of the whole building was very, very confusing, and it was built with one purpose and one purpose only, which was to lure people in, take their money, and kill them. He would torture, murder, and dissect people who came to his home, and then he would collect insurance money from their bodies afterwards. He would file insurance claims, just like he did. He was a con man. That's what he was good at doing. Construction workers were a bit weary of why he was building the building the way he was, but again, Holmes was a very, very smart man, and he was ready for them to be confused. So he would hire workers to build very tiny, tiny sections of this murder house, and then after they built a section when they were getting to they, when they started questioning him too much about why they were building it he would fire them and then he would somehow find a way to blame it on them like they broke part of the contract or something like that and then he wouldn't pay them for it so pretty much this whole murder house he had built for free because he got out of paying construction workers as for the murder castle itself it looked very innocent from the outside until you went to stay in the hotel. The top third floor was never finished and it actually became Holmes' office and maybe sort of like an apartment. He stored old furniture up there, which was another means he used to make money. He would take furniture from people, flip it and sell it for more than he got it for, things like that. He was all about money. He was a money man. The middle floor, which was the hotel, had about 35 rooms total, but they weren't actually rooms. Most of them were not like livable rooms. People couldn't actually stay in them. These rooms included tiny chambers, rooms with no windows, rooms with just four walls, and the only way in was a trap door in the ceiling. So you had to like fall through the floor from the top to get inside, and then you couldn't get out. And once these victims would fall inside the rooms with like the four walls they would just be there to slowly die like they would just slowly starve i guess in this room until they died this castle had staircases that led to nowhere they had staircases that were only accessible from certain rooms and certain bathrooms there was tons of corridors that were used to disorient his victims and just get them confused so he would have total and complete control of these people. There was walls that opened like doors, and there was actually a chute in the building that went down to the basement, and he would drop bodies down the chute to go straight to the basement, which was his favorite part of the murder house. I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but that's where he did most of his killing was down there in the basement. He had a room that was like a massive vault. It had a huge vault door on it. And he would trick people to go inside, like lure them to this room, get them to go in somehow. He was very charming, so it was easy for him. But he would get them to go in, and then he would slam the door shut, lock them in with the vault door, and leave them there to die. A lot of these rooms doubled as gas chambers as well. There was tiny little vents in the room, and he had a control panel up on the third floor, which was his apartment or office. 
and he could control what goes through the vents, and he would gas people in these rooms, I guess. There were compartments in the walls that were, like, just big enough to fit a body inside of, so it wasn't, like, a room. It wasn't intended to ever be a room. It was literally just intended enough to put a body inside, and I don't know if he was putting live people in there or just bodies of people he had already killed that he was just, like, trying to hide. I'm not exactly sure on what the use of those were. Uh, I tried to figure out, but I couldn't really find any more information on that. Most, if not all, of the rooms were actually soundproofed, so that was really, really smart because he would have people downstairs and people in other rooms around, but they wouldn't hear anything going on in the room next to them because everything was soundproof. They had no idea that people were dying in the room next to them. One of the rooms, when I was researching it, that really, like, got to me and I was like, wow, that, that's messed up, is a room that he had that had iron plates on the walls and they had blow torches behind them. So the blow torches were turned on when someone was put in the room and then the plates would heat up. So the whole room pretty much turned into an oven and he would cook these people inside this room. And other people had no idea that this was going on. A lot of homes methods of killing were very medieval so he had like medieval torture devices like walls with spikes and people would get in the walls and then they would close and the spikes would go straight through them now the basement it was only accessible through a trap door and a bathroom and if anyone went into a place in the house that Holmes didn't want them to go he would immediately know because he had set up buzzers and those buzzers would sound when people would go to places that they weren't supposed to be and he would immediately know to stop what he was doing, clean up, get out of there and go find this person and be like, oh, what are you doing here? Why are you in this part? Let me show you where you're supposed to go. The basement was where he did most of the murders, like I said. He had a dissection table, a crematorium, an acid bath. He would hang and display bodies until he could figure out what he wanted to do with them later he mostly dissected people. Holmes was a certified doctor, so everything was very surgical, like what he did to them. You could tell that he knew what he was doing with the anatomy of a person. One of his favorite methods of getting rid of the bodies, I guess, is he would skin the people and remove all the muscle and tissue. And then he would clean and bleach the skeleton and then sell them to medical schools and doctors and places like that, I guess, that needed skeletons and didn't want to pay full price for them. They bought them from homes for cheaper. He made money, they saved money, but I don't think these people knew that they were buying, like, people that he killed before. I think they were just trying to get a deal. I don't know where you would buy a skeleton or how much that would be full price, but... I guess that was the whole point of it, was that they were saving money buying it from him. Most of his victims tended to be young women. He would lure them into the hotel and offer them jobs, and he sometimes would occasionally lure strangers as well off the street and offer them jobs in the hotel. But the purpose behind giving them a job was that he made every single employee take out a life insurance policy and make him the main beneficiary. So if anything happened to them, he would collect all the money for them. And a lot of his employees died under tragic circumstances, so that way he could collect their insurance money. He was a con man. Once again, he did a lot of insurance fraud. That was what he was good at. And that's why he had so many aliases. He knew that these companies would catch on if he kept using the same name over and over again. So he stopped using the same name and started using aliases. But... In 1893 is when the Columbus World Expedition started. It was a famous fair that traveled to Chicago, and in the 1800s, there wasn't a method of, like, booking a hotel in advance or finding a place to stay in advance, so most of these people were coming to this fair and just gonna find a place to stay when they got there, and Holmes saw that as a perfect opportunity to lure people in and kill them, because... No relatives would be looking for where they were because they would just be assuming that they were staying in a room for a night and there was no way to really track anybody down in the 1800s. 
So he went to this fair and he worked his charm on a bunch of women and he proposed to them and sweet talked them and offered to marry tons of them. And then they went back to the hotel with him and that's where he killed most of them. Now, we don't know for a fact that he actually killed anybody from this fair, but it's very plausible. The count could be in the 200s or even zero people that he claimed from the Columbus expedition. His very first confirmed victim was a woman named Julia Smith. She was actually married to a man named Ned Connor. He worked in the jewelry store at Holmes Murder Castle, and sometimes Julia would come and visit Ned for work, and that's where Holmes started to get to know Julia. And eventually they started flirting, and then it grew into an affair. And very quickly, Holmes offered Ned, Julia, and their six-year-old daughter, Pearl, a place to stay at the hotel. But eventually Ned caught on to the affair and he left Julia and their six-year-old daughter there at the hotel. Later on, it was rumored that Julia actually fell pregnant with Holmes' child and that he offered to perform an abortion on her. And because he was a certified doctor, she didn't think anything of it and she agreed to let him perform this abortion. But somehow she didn't survive from this abortion that was performed but we don't actually know how Holmes killed her, but we also do know that Holmes did kill her six-year-old daughter as well, but we also don't know how he killed her either. And then just two weeks later, he was renting out the room that uh, Julia and Pearl stayed in, and it still had their belongings in it. Like, there was a doll on the floor that belonged to Pearl, and Julia's dresses were still hung up in the wardrobe and things of that nature, and he was just letting people come and stay there. But if he really cared that much about Julia, like, why would he let people come stay in that room with all of her stuff still there? About six months after Julia's murder, Holmes hired a woman named Emily to come work in the hotel as a typewriter. And very quickly, Holmes and Emily started seeing each other and having an affair. But it was no secret. Everybody knew that they were seeing each other. They were very um, open about it, I would say. But that following Christmas, Emily actually disappeared, like vanished. And Holmes told everybody that she went and lived in Europe and that she got married out there. And then very shortly after that, there was a similar story that went on with a woman named Edna. She also worked at the hotel and also went missing under mysterious circumstances. And again, similar story to Emily's story that she had ran off somewhere. Around this time is whenever he became friends with a man named Benjamin Peitzel. Now, he's not very important right now, but he was the only person that Holmes trusted. Now, Benjamin never actually knew anything about Holmes' murders or anything of that nature. He was oblivious to that, but Holmes did trust him quite a lot to tell him about insurance scams and things of that nature. Benjamin was about six foot something and it said that he was a little bit on the dumb side. So Holmes being a smart man knew that he could convince Benjamin to do a lot for him. A lot of people actually describe Benjamin as being Holmes tool or creature if that tells you anything about how much control Holmes had over Benjamin. There was a very manipulative relationship between the two of them, but they committed tons and tons of scams together. And now we're going to go back um, to talking about Holmes. I just wanted to throw in Benjamin so that way you knew who he was and you had an idea because he's very important later in the story. H.H. Holmes' fifth victim was a woman named Minnie Williams. She was an actress from Boston. She had a very, very wealthy family and they owned lots of land in Texas. He planned to get the land from Minnie, but it wasn't as simple as just killing her off and getting the deed in his name or anything like that because Minnie had an older sister named Nanny. But very, very quickly, Holmes got Minnie to fall in love with him, and Minnie was sending letters to her sister back in Boston about this man that she had met and how she was so in love with him. Somehow along the way, Holmes convinced Minnie to sign over the deed to her land to a man she had never met named Alexander Bond, which was another one of Holmes' aliases. Now, Minnie had no idea at the time that it was Holmes that she was signing the land over to, but that's who it was. But that wasn't the end of it because he still had to get the land from Nanny, and he did. And the way he did this was he got in contact with Nanny, 
and told her, come to Chicago, you can stay in the hotel, and I want to surprise Minnie. I don't want her to know that you're coming. Don't tell her you're coming. Come here, take the train, I'll pick you up from the station, and then we'll come back and surprise her. So that's what she did. She took a train all the way to Chicago, he picked her up, and once she got settled in, he told her, hey, come on, I'll show you where Minnie's room is at, we can go surprise her now. And so they went to a room, and this room was the big vault room that I mentioned in the beginning. He took her to that room and told her that Minnie was behind the door, and he opened it up, and she went in, and he slammed the door closed behind her and locked it tight. Now, I'm not sure exactly how it went down, like how he killed her in there, but it is said that he possibly leaked acid into the room somehow, because whenever they found the murder house and they went into this room there was imprints of nanny's foot skin on the floor and on the door of the vault but it is possible that she died from starvation or maybe even gassing something of that nature and this whole time minnie was just a few rooms away he then went on to kill minnie williams and we're also not sure of how he killed her either There is a lot of missing information when it comes to this case because, again, it is so old that the documentation was very, very poor. Around this time is when insurance companies started to get really, really suspicious of Holmes. So he fled to Texas before they could ever come and find him. But before he settled in Texas, he traveled a few different states and then eventually went and settled on this new plot of land that he inherited from Minnie Williams. Through the traveling is how he picked up his third or fourth wife named Georgiana Yoke, who he actually met in Colorado while he was traveling states. In Texas, he went on to think about how he could continue murdering people and how to continue his murder castle. So he began building a new, better, and complex murder castle. But before he could go on to fulfill the blueprints of that and have it built, he was actually arrested in Texas. And not for what you would think, he was arrested for stealing horses. In jail is where he met a notorious criminal named Marion Hedgepath, and they became friends. They shared a lot of the same interests. Not exactly sure what those interests were um, besides criminal activity, but I guess that's one of them. I don't know. Holmes began telling Marion how he was planning the biggest insurance scam of his life, and he said that it would be very, very hard, and he was not wrong. He told Marion Hedgepath that he was going to fake his own death and claim the insurance money. He then went on to promise Marion $500 of the insurance money, which would have been about $10,000, if Marion Hedgepath could find him a good lawyer that would help him finish the scam off and get him the money. So whenever Holmes got out, he went and met with Hedgepath's lawyer and they began planning this insurance scheme. But the insurance companies were already very, very wary of his name and didn't believe it at all. So this is when Benjamin Peitzel comes back into the picture. So Holmes convinced Benjamin Peitzel that it was a great idea that he faked his death and that they would collect the insurance money for him and his family would get the biggest portion of the money. The plan was to put Peitzel in hiding and find a cadaver that matched his measurements because at the time they didn't do like fingerprinting or DNA tests or anything like that to identify a body. They did it by your measurements, like your height and your like width here. And I'm not really sure, but I know it was by measurement. So they found a cadaver that measured the same as him. So the plan with this cadaver was to get it, mutilate it, burn it, and then say that Peitzel had died in some kind of tragic accident like he had done with multiple, multiple cadavers before. This wasn't a new gig for him doing it to somebody else. So Peitzel had set himself up to be an inventor named B.F. Perry, who had died in some kind of tragic lab accident. After a few days, Peitzel started to get cold feet, and he didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to back out. But Holmes couldn't have that because he needed this money, like really needed it. So Holmes started to comfort him and just told him, hey, like, everything's gonna be okay, like, we're gonna get through this, we'll work it out, come back tomorrow, and we'll talk about it, we'll go over the plan again. So, when Pitzel came back the next day, that's when Holmes started to realize that 
Pitzel wasn't going to do it. And so Holmes started talking through it with him, just going over the plan again, saying that it was all going to work out just how they had planned it to. They got the cadaver, they got the measurements right, but Pitzel still wasn't going to do it. So Holmes started to get him really drunk. During the whole conversation, he's giving him drinks and just getting him drunker and drunker. And then eventually, he got so drunk that he couldn't really correlate what he was doing. And Holmes knocked him out with chloroform and then burned him alive. But no one knew that Holmes killed Pitzel. So Holmes filed the insurance claim and Pitzel's family came and identified him and had no idea that they were actually identifying their father and their husband. They all thought that he was in hiding somewhere, that Holmes had put him in hiding and that he was just fine. So the whole scheme was a success and they got the $10,000 of the insurance money for Pitzel's death. Most of that money was going to go to Pitzel's family and then $500 to Marion Hethpath and then money to the lawyer who helped them out. But Holmes didn't want to give any of that money away. He wanted all the money for himself. He didn't want to give anything to the Pitzel family for their contribution to the scheme. He didn't want to give anything to Marion Hedgepath. He didn't want to give anything to the lawyer. So apparently this whole time, Pitzel was hiding out in London and he was just waiting for his family to get there. But Holmes told Pitzel's wife that they couldn't go there immediately because it would leave a trail in that the insurance company would get suspicious on what they were doing. So he told them that they needed to split into two groups. So Pitzel's wife had the oldest and the youngest child and Holmes took the three middle children. So they split into two different groups. They were supposed to go to London after a while of moving around. And during this whole time, like him moving the families, the three children, from house to house to house and Pitzel's wife and the other two children from house to house to house. Georgiana Yoke, her, his wife, had no idea that he was doing that. Like, none whatsoever. He was taking these three children to different homes every night or every two nights or so and he would leave them there and he'd do the same with Pitzel's wife and the other children. And then he'd go home to his wife every single night. So... He must have had, like, a lot of time in his day to be able to manage three different families and his wife have no clue. Like, none whatsoever. I don't really know how long that went on for, but it definitely wasn't a long-term plan. It wasn't something that Holmes wanted to continue to do. So, Holmes eventually killed all three children. All three of the middle children from the Pitzel family. Their names were Howard, Nellie, and Alice. Howard, the oldest of the middle was actually killed in a very similar fashion to Benjamin Peitzel. He was poisoned, sliced into pieces, and then burned over the stove. So he was burned just like his father was, which is like really eerie to me that you kill them in the same fashion when they're from the same family. In that house, they were able to confirm his death because they found some of his teeth and also some DNA evidence on the stove. In Canada is where he killed the two girls. He forced them to get into a box and he drilled a tiny hole in the box and then he gassed them. The girls were actually found without any clothes on, so they believe there was some kind of sexual motivation towards that murder. Meanwhile, while he killed these three children, he's still moving Mrs. Peitzel and the other two children around from home to home. And he still hasn't paid anyone yet, but... Hedgepath knew what Holmes was like, and he knew he wasn't going to get any of his money for helping him with the deal, and he was really, really unhappy with that, so he ratted Holmes out. He told the police about Holmes faking his own death and that not working, so him having Benjamin Peitzel fake his own death, and somehow, Marion Hedgepath knew that Holmes had actually killed Benjamin Peitzel. So he told the police that he was also a murderer, that he had killed Benjamin Peisel. So they were trying to track down Holmes, but they couldn't find him. Again, Holmes was a smart man and he knew how to maneuver. So it wasn't easy to find Holmes. But the police did end up tracking down Mrs. Peitzel and the two children that she had. And they were informed of the situation and she was 
utterly terrified. She felt really betrayed by him. And still, this man had her kids, and she had no idea where they were. So she pointed the police in the direction of Holmes' family. But Holmes was only found with his wife and not the three children. So police went on to search all of Holmes' properties, and they found the bodies, and they also found DNA evidence of Howard being killed. So Holmes was arrested, and during the investigation, he admitted to all of the fraud, but to none of the murders. He denied each and every single murder over and over again. They decided they wanted to search all of Holmes' properties and find whatever they could against him. So that's when they decided to search the murder castle. They knew that they were bound to find more evidence against him, and they did. They found some of Minnie's hair and her jewelry. They found the bones of the six-year-old girl Pearl in the basement. They found all of these different doors and chambers and locked away places in the murder castle. In the rooms where victims had been locked inside, there were scratches and dents on the walls from them, I guess, trying to get out, like just trying to scratch their way out. They, of course, found the acid baths in the basement and the crematorium and the dissection tables. They found loads of blood-stained women's clothing. Whenever he was in custody, it was very confusing because he would admit to 27 murders and then zero murders and then two murders, but he would go back to 27. So as police looked into it, the 27 people that Holmes named that he killed were either still alive or had died because of natural causes. A local newspaper had offered Holmes a pretty large chunk of money to admit to killing 27 people because they believe that it could be a really interesting headline, like, America's first serial killer killed 27 people, but it was only actually confirmed that he ever killed nine people, but it could be up into the 200s. We actually have no idea how many people Holmes killed. H.H. Holmes was ultimately found guilty for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. At that time, it was very easy to get sentenced to death. Like, all he needed was that one murder. They didn't have to catch him on every single murder that he had committed. So he was sentenced to death, and he was hung on May 7th of 1896. He was hung at Philadelphia prison, and he was said to have not showed pretty much any emotion at all. He was very, very calm. He did have one last wish and request, which was to be encased in concrete like his coffin and buried 10 feet deep because he feared that people would dig him up and dissect him, which is what he did to other people. So it's really odd that he was scared it was going to be done to him. So when it comes to hangings, normally when they let you go, like your neck will break instantly and that's what kills you. But Holmes' neck actually didn't snap and he hung there for about 15 minutes just choking and suffocating. They said that he was like spazzing, that it was like really creepy to watch. After 20 minutes, he was pronounced dead. And then in 1895, the murder castle was actually blown up. There was two men in the building. Um, They were seen going in. They were in there for about two hours and then they ran away and then the building exploded. Those men were never identified. The building actually withstood the fire from the explosion, but actually wasn't completely torn down until about 40 years later. It was actually in use, I believe. Not completely positive, don't quote me on that, but I think it was in use. There are some conspiracies that go along with this case, and again, they're just conspiracies, but I do want to throw them in because I think they're really interesting, so you might think they're interesting. So there is a theory that H.H. Holmes avoided his own hanging. Like, people were convinced that he convinced someone else to be hung for him and that he ran away and went into hiding somewhere. And this was widely believed for over a hundred years that he escaped his own death. Even his own descendants, his great-great-great-grandson, demanded that H.H. Holmes was exhumed from his grave so that way they could test the DNA or whatever you can test from a body that old. And that was actually in 2017, so that was 
pretty, pretty recent that they exhumed his body. Because of how his body was encased in concrete whenever he was buried, his clothes that he had on and his mustache were perfectly intact. Like, no damage. So I believe they checked against his dental records and were able to identify him as H.H. H. Holmes. So they reburied his body. So it is confirmed that he did actually hang and that he did actually die. It wasn't someone else. So it's not really a conspiracy because it's been confirmed. But it was believed for about 100 years. So I wanted to put it in there. And then another one is that his descendants very, very strongly believe that H.H. H. Holmes was Jack the Ripper as well. If you don't know who Jack the Ripper is, he was the UK's most infamous serial killer in the 1800s. He was active in 1888. The Ripper murders and H.H. H. Holmes murders were all done in a very similar fashion. Most of their victims were all women, and both of them, Jack, Jack the Ripper and H.H. H. Holmes, seem to have a very, very good understanding of human anatomy. In one of Jack the Ripper's murders, he fully removed a woman's womb, and you cannot do that unless you have a really good understanding of the human body. In both of these cases, the bodies were so mutilated afterwards that you could barely even tell who these people were. And there were some people who claimed to see Jack the Ripper in the UK at the time of the murders, and of course, they gave their descriptions, and there was a sketch made of what they believed Jack the Ripper looked like. And that sketch is so, so, so incredibly similar to H.H. H. Holmes. It's crazy. The sketch that was made of Jack the Ripper was actually based on 11 eyewitnesses' accounts. And Holmes' descendants really did believe, really do believe, that he is Jack the Ripper. So they took these sketches to an FBI agent and... That agent said that those two pictures side by side was the most similar set of photos that he has seen in his whole entire career. And also at that time, the descendants of H.H. H. Holmes were given letters that Holmes had written to his lawyer in the 1800s. And in a lot of those letters, he expressed the desire to visit London. There is a quote from one of the letters. It says, it's difficult to be found in London. That's the quote. A lot of people believe that whenever he was traveling and he was in London, that he got a criminal record there and he gave them some kind of alias. And that's why he didn't have a record under the name H.H. H. Holmes. But uh, there's not actually any factual evidence to back that up. I just wanted to put that in there too. Those same letters were actually sent to a handwriting expert with excerpts from the Jack the Ripper letters. Jack the Ripper letters were found to be from Jack the Ripper, like positively identified from being from him. And they came back as a 97% match to each other, which is like really, really high. It's very unlikely that you will even get a 100% match with your own handwriting. Like you write something on a piece of paper and you write something on another piece of paper barely will you get back 100%. Like, it'll be like 98% or something. So it's really difficult to get that. But the Ripper killings happened in 1888, and it was for a short time span, and then Jack the Ripper just disappeared. But to me, it kind of makes more sense that it didn't just stop and he didn't disappear. He just moved to Chicago to his murder house and continued his killings there. But... That's still a theory, a conspiracy. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I hope you guys really did enjoy this video. I enjoyed making and researching it. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.